Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. Los Angeles is the city most people think of as the center of film production in the U.S. But New York City has an almost equally vibrant filmmaking community. There's NYU's fabled film school, which gave us director Spike Lee, Kaufman Astoria Studios in Queens, and Steiner Studios in Brooklyn. And since 2015, there's been a new addition to the city's film world, Brooklyn College's Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema, located on the Steiner Studios film lot. What's going on at this latest of New York City's film schools? Who are its students, its teachers, and what does it see as its unique mission? Here to answer those questions are Charles Hain, acting program director of the Fierstein School, and Carla Mullick, director, producer, writer, and an alum of the school. Welcome. Thank you. I suspect most New Yorkers don't know that Brooklyn has its own graduate school of film. Um, tell me how and why the Fierstein School got started. So the Fierstein School is a mission-driven film program that launched out of the main program at Brooklyn College and was really launched originally uh, out of a recognition that, you know, the film industry has huge inequality problems, right? Like we see this like continually with gender balance behind the camera, but also socioeconomic balance behind the camera, racial balance behind the camera. It has been very slow to adapt. So Brooklyn College really wanted to launch a graduate level film program that was specifically mission focused on serving those communities. On the flip side, Doug Steiner was building Steiner Studios. Doug Steiner was eager to have a film school in Steiner Studios. And Doug Steiner was a real big proponent of public education. So uh, I wasn't actually around at that time. So this is all information I've heard from talking to people who were there. But he was one, like he was continually focused as he was meeting with a variety of people talking about opening a campus there. He was really interested in it being a public school. So it was really sort of, you know, these two things coming together. Brooklyn College is, you know, it's one of the most diverse schools in the Northeast, one of the most diverse schools in the country. Their real focus on a diverse mission-driven film program had this location that was sort of perfectly set up for it. And the two came together with a generous donation from Barry Fierstein that sort of kicked things off and we were able to open in 2015. Okay, now how many students do you have? We have about 230 students at That's the moment. It's grown since it opened, right? It has grown since it's opened. Uh, we're now, we're not quite full, but we're getting close to full, which feels really good. And uh, it's all full-time graduate students, so it's 230 people showing up every day at our facility in Steiner. Okay, and you have two programs, two master's degree program. There's a three-year Master of Fine Arts program, uh, which offers eight different tracks. Yeah. Uh, concentrations, and you have a two-year MA in Cinema Arts. What's the difference between the two programs? Uh, so our cinema, uh, our cinema Studies program is the two-year program, and the Cinema Studies is really the sort of theoretical... More you know, academic. You're, more academic. You're interested in writing papers, although half of them end up making video work of some sort. But uh, it's really sort of a professorial academic track, as opposed to the, you know, Cinema Arts program, the three-year program, which is a we're trying to turn out filmmakers. We're really trying to give people all of the skills they need to make movies. So our cinematography students are shooting two projects their first year, two or three their second year, two or three their third year that are really designed to help them launch a career straight out into the industry. And the same is true across all the specializations in cinema arts. <gasps> A three-year program, I mean, it seems to some people like a long slog, especially um, these are full-time students, right? So I, I assume they, they are not working jobs for, th for those All three All of years. our, I would say 95% of our students have jobs outside really? of school. Really? Okay. Well, I mean, we are the most affordable film school in New York City What's at the, the graduate tuition? level. A three-year program is around 50 or 60 as opposed to NYU or Columbia where it's 140 to 200 depending. A year for the? For the three-year program. Okay, okay. So it is uh, about a third the cost from our major competitors, but still we are focused on economic diversity is one of the things we're most excited about at a film school. Film has traditionally been this industry where there's, a, you know, the, the cost of barrier is high. It's years of free labor. It's two or three years at an internship or working at a sub-poverty wage assistantship where the expectation is, is your family's covering you while you beat right. your head against the industry. Right. We really want to fight against that. So we're very focused on having the widest diversity of economic backgrounds possible, but that often means that the vast majority of our students, even while they're in a full-time film program, are working. 
Now, <laughs> a lot of them work on campus, which we're really excited about. So they're working in the equipment room, they're working in the post lab, they're working in the facility, so they're spending more time with their students and they're learning more skills in those jobs, but most of our students are working. How do you decide who gets in? Uh, well, so it's an application process and an interview, and it's always really hard. Uh, it's, you know, you're always looking for people who have a, a commitment and an excitement to learn and grow. So, uh, you know, you get, a, I, I hope I'm not breaking anybody's anonymity uh, sharing, but you get letters sometimes of, you know, we, we got an application a couple years ago from someone who's like, I'm in my 50s and my kids are in their 20s and I want to tell them to chase their dreams and I realized I never chased mine, so I have to do this. And you're looking for that kind of like, this is a person who feels like they never got the opportunity to do this and now they have to do it because they're realizing that they never pursued this thing they wanted so much. So those kind of things, when those show up in application letters, those are the kind of things that like really like warm your heart and you're like, oh wow, this is the kind of person we're excited to have in the program. And we're looking for people who are enthusiastic to keep, to learn and grow and who are ready for the challenge ahead. I mean, a full-time three-year grad program is a lot of work. Yeah. I've heard you say in, in another interview that film school has pretty much become a requirement for getting into the movie making business these days. What I always say about film school is film school is really good for certain people and not necessary for other people. Okay. It is entirely possible. I mean, film is one of the last bastions where you really, you could drop out of high school and start working on film sets and claw your way to the top without a film school education if you are the right type of personality. So I don't think film school is necessary for everybody. I will absolutely say it was necessary for me. And for many people it's really necessary because I, I have so many friends who, uh, you know, got, pursued film in their 20s and were not able to keep doing their own work. Because you know, you need to make a living. So they would get a job as a PA or they would get a job as something else and that job would keep them so busy that they weren't writing and they weren't making their own things. I have a really good friend I went to college with 20 years ago who just got out of grad school and we were talking about it all the time and he was like, oh my God, after 15 years I'm like making stuff again. Like I made four short films, which in my 15 years of working on film sets, he hadn't made anything of his own. So I think it's a really valuable thing for certain people I think if you're the kind of person where external deadlines help, film school is wonderful. I think it's really great for building a career. But I, I think for, you know, there are certain people who are like just going to be able to climb up that ladder outside of film school and that's perfectly legitimate. Um, but I think if you're the kind of person who, you know, like I'm a slow community builder. It takes me a long time to, to feel like I'm really part of a community. So film school was wonderful for me because at the end of my three year film school experience, I had built relationships that I went on to start companies with and I still work on projects with it. But it takes me a long time to do yeah. that. Um, there are other people that like one day on a film set are their best friends and they're writing a movie together and three weeks later and you know, it's different personalities. But I do think film school is a really valuable, valuable accelerator for a career. What does it mean uh, for your school to be located on the Steiner Studio lot? Uh, I think it means a lot of things. Uh, I mean, one thing it means is direct relationship access for uh, some students. Now, not all 230 of our students have internships on productions at Steiner, and a lot of our students have internships on productions all over the city. So we have people who are interning at Light Iron in Manhattan and Technicolor in Manhattan, and we have other internships, but we're also able, because we're there at Steiner, uh, we're, we've been able, some of our students have worked on the uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which shoots at Steiner. We've had students who were able to intern on shows like uh, West Side Story. So those relationships, because we're so geographically close, really help. And then what's really great is we're able to bring a lot of people from those programs to our facility. So, you know, uh, David Mullen, a wonderful cinematographer, shot many episodes of Mrs. Maisel, would come over like not on a shoot day, because shoot days are very long, but on a prep day or a scout day, he would then come over and give a talk to the cinematography students. And we really like trying to build those bridges. <laughs> and geographic closeness, I mean, geogra geography dictates a lot of things. Do you use the Steiner facilities or do you have separate facilities of so your own? So we're technically within the boundaries of Steiner, but we have four of our own stages. So we have our own large sound stage and three production stages and all of that. Um, and then. Also, I think the other benefit of Steiner Studios is psychological. Like, I still find it thrilling to go to work on a soundstage every day, and every once in a while you'll be in the elevator, and there'll be two people in Roman Centurion costumes, and, like, it does, 
there's an energy to a film lot that I think is powerful. Uh, tell me about the, um, the, the, the different tracks in the, um, in the Master of Fine Arts program. Yeah. What, are those, what are those eight tracks? So we have directing, cinematography, producing, screenwriting, post-production, uh, digital animation and visual effects, which we call Dave, uh, media scoring, and sonic arts. Okay. And uh, basically the film industry is one in which uh, a lot of film schools take a very broad, we're gonna, we're gonna teach you all of the skills. And um, Fierstein has made a decision where the first year, you are very, especially the first semester, you are learning a broad basis. So we're trying to get everybody to have a little bit of an understanding of a lot of things. But then after that, you really take a deep dive within your track, with the feeling being that by specializing in something early on, you're able to dig much, much deeper than you would otherwise. So, What does one learn in the producing track? I mean, do you learn, I mean, I would think you'd learn how to make a lot of money, so you... <laughs> I mean, that, what do you learn? What do you study in the producing track? Well, I mean, track? Cola went through the producing <laughs> track, so maybe that would be a better question for Cola. Um, I think you learn a, a mix of things. So it's film financing, um, distribution and exhibition. There was a, a class that we took where we had to develop our own ideas and pitch them, and I found that really um, helpful because as a producer, I think a lot of people wonder, like, what does a producer do? Are you the person that brings in the money? And it's like, eh, not more when you're that. in film school. Um, it is more than that. I think sometimes a producer is the person that's helping the director raise money for the project. But sometimes a producer is the person that is bringing the material to the director, right? So if you have a book that you've always loved and you want an option, like Scott Rudin does this all the time, um, you get that creative material and then you start developing it into a film and then you align a director and then you build the team around it. So I think a producer can do a lot of things and at Fierstein we were able to get a understanding of all the different facets of what a producer does from you know, optioning material to developing their own material and pitching it to how do you budget a film and what are the ways that people finance films and how do you raise money. Okay, we'll talk more about your experience after we take a short break, then we'll be back with Charles Hain, acting director of the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema at Brooklyn College, and director, producer, and writer, Kala Mullick, one of the school's graduates. Hello, welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking to Charles Hain, acting director of the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema at Brooklyn College and director, producer, and writer, Kala Mullick, one of the school's graduate. Um, Kala, I understand you worked in healthcare and cancer research before entering school, uh, film school. That's quite a switch. What, why'd you make it? Yeah, um, so when I graduated from undergrad, I had basically worked in different facets of healthcare, from like PR to then most recently before going to film school, I was in cancer research. And in between those different jobs, I got a job on a Pakistani TV show. So I, would, I was laid off from my first job out of school and I realized I didn't want to do PR. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and I had a friend who reached out to me. We had worked on some theater stuff together and he's like, oh, I know this director. Um, she's looking for an assistant. So I was like, okay, I like her work. Um, I interviewed with the director, I got the job, but the job was to be an assistant director and not the assistant which I didn't even know what that meant at the time, but... What's the difference? Huge. So the assistant is like you're helping the director, but the assistant director, you're essentially responsible for like making sure that your production is on time, on schedule, like your date, you meet your days, everything. Um, and so I did that job. It was baptism by fire and I fell in love with film. And I did some freelance stuff here and there, but you know, as Charles was mentioning earlier, it's you can't always find like kind of like that financial um, support that you need from some of these gigs. So I was like, okay, I gotta get a real job again. <laughs> and so I got a job working in cancer research and I really loved the healthcare and science field. But wh while I was doing that, um, I realized I was sort of at this crossroads of do I pursue kind of healthcare full time? Like, do I go back to medical school? Do I go to nursing school? 
or do I kind of, um, you know, re-examine what I want to do and apply for film school. So I had just heard about Feuerstein through a friend and I was like, okay, this is low stakes. I'll just apply. It's a new school. And I think one of the things that I had a hesitation about earlier when I was thinking about film school was the cost of it. And so when I saw that there was a public film school that was going to be opening in New York City, I was like, okay, I guess I can apply. I'm probably a candidate that they would take um, because I'm kind of switching gears. They're brand new, so maybe they're open to like taking people who are you know, just starting out or have had some experience but have been doing um, work in a different uh, career path. So I applied to the producing track. So most of my experience prior to film school had been in the producing writing world. But I wanted to apply for producing because I felt like regardless of the kind of filmmaker I become, like the producing skill set will be really valuable. Because it's about bringing everything together. Yeah. So you graduated when, last year? Yeah, 2018. What was the experience It like was amazing. You? It was amazing. It was, you know, I was nervous at first because I felt like, you know, I'm someone who's changing careers, who's entering film school, and I felt like everyone else that was going to be in my cohort was maybe already going to be working in film, but it was really great because everybody was super diverse. People were coming from different backgrounds. There were some people that had just come from undergrad who were doing film already, so it was a great mix of people. I felt like the professors were amazing, and to me, I learned so much in that first, just that first semester that made me... Uh, never regret like, you know, taking the leap to go to film school. And I felt like Feuerstein was a great place to take that risk and like make mistakes and just keep learning. It was such a great environment to challenge yourself and feel supported. I saw on your website that you are working on a film about transgender people in Pakistan and about two gay lawyers in Japan. Did you have to travel to make those films? And if so, where'd the money for that come from? So I didn't travel to make the film in Japan. I was hired as the associate producer, so my responsibility for that film was working with the team that was based in London, Paris, and Osaka, that's where the director was based, to help raise money for to finish post-production. So I kind of um, took on the reins of planning our Kickstarter campaign, keeping in touch with people, and working with the director and the producer to make sure that we hit our goal. Um, the film has been released. I think it, sh it was playing What's it on, called? It's called Of Love and Law, and it was playing on Alaska Airlines flights oh, earlier really? this year. Yeah, yeah. As part of, um, I believe it was Pride Month, so it was uh, playing in June on Alaska Airlines flights. And then for The Noble Half, which I've been directing in Pakistan, I've been going back and forth for the last four years, and mostly it has been out of pocket, my own money or on my credit card, and in the fall, I raised a good amount of money that I'm going to be using to start the edit and then go back in the new year. Charles, is the film industry opening up to transgenders? I mean, I mean, I, I don't know that I would be the right person to speak to that issue specifically, but I would say that the film industry is in a moment where it is deeply self-reflective about who has had access and who hasn't. And there is a legitimate effort in many quarters to open up access much wider. I can't say that like every production is actually trying and I can't say every production is perfect, but I see even within the last two or three years, like I remember I was on a movie in uh, 2012 working with an actress and I had a female cinematographer and two female ACs and the actress who was in her 80s and had been in movies, she'd been in 200 movies since the 40s, uh, stopped production at one point and was like, I just want everyone to know that this is the first all-female camera crew I've ever worked with. All right, we can continue. And like that was 2012. I, I would, I don't think that's something most people would say today. I think you run into all female camera crews way more often in 2019 than you would in 2012. Mm -hmm. I think you, I think there is a, an active effort with um, platforms like Free the Work, the uh, platform created by Alma Harrell and partners to really diversify talent behind the camera and uh, other platforms. I think we're seeing Many people are trying very hard to, make, to be way more open and inclusive behind the camera. Carla, what are your aspirations going forward? I, right now, am developing a feature and, you know, producing commercial work. So for me, as long as I can keep working in the industry, I'll be happy.
Charles, uh, you, you graduated, obviously, the first class. How many in the first class to graduate? So our first class was a little smaller. It was a little over 50. Mm -hmm. And then our second class that just graduated was a little over 70. So they okay. just graduated in May. And uh, we're about to graduate our third class here in the spring. What kinds of things, you told us what you're doing, mm -hmm. what kinds of things are your other graduates doing? So we have a really wide and exciting diversity of uh, things that are uh, people are doing. So I was just talking to some uh, post-production students and people already have full-time jobs working on, you know, I have uh, two people who are working on HBO projects in full-time capacities. I just got an email from someone uh, this morning at HBO saying, hey, do you have any other alumni? We have this new thing that we're trying to fill as quickly as possible. So uh, the fact that there's all of this post work in New York has been really good. But then I was also talking to another graduate who is starting a social media millennial focused sub brand for a commercial agency out west. So she's in charge of heading that up and it's an established company and she's going to be running the sort of sub brand out west. So people are spreading uh, out from New York. I mean, we're always excited to have people stay in New York and there's a lot of work here, but it's also exciting that we're starting to see our students launch into careers in other places too. Uh, either or both of you can answer. This. What do you see as the biggest obstacle or obstacles to aspiring filmmakers? Um, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. I mean, it is the film industry is increasing, is, is a place that is not designed around iteration. So, uh, you know, there's this uh, crazy statistic uh, where somebody was like, the biggest problem in the film industry isn't getting your first feature made, it's getting your second feature made. And the, there's this idea in film, and I think it goes back to the way we make movies, where like you prep and prep and prep, and then you shoot it all at once, and it's either good or it's bad. And uh, I think finding opportunities to support careers long term are the big challenges that are facing filmmakers because you know I see so many filmmakers who get it all together and they get this amazing thesis film made and that leads to more work. But I also see filmmakers where the thesis film doesn't necessarily come together and that doesn't mean they're a bad filmmaker. It's hard to make a good movie and, and everybody who's made a bunch of things have made things that are better than others. But there's this very roll of the dice feeling about launching a film career where it's like, all right, I roll it once and if it doesn't land, I'm out. And uh, I think that is a big challenge. The film industry is not someone, the film industry tends to very much be like, all right, well, if you didn't do it perfectly the first time, you're out. And uh, that's something I think is a challenge for filmmakers to overcome. Mm. And I think just piggybacking off what Charles is saying, I think it's particularly, particularly a challenge for women. And so I think the biggest thing that I see that's an issue is representation for people of color or women where you have these, um, initiatives that have that are being started to help and support filmmakers like me but there's a lot of competition because there's a lot of talent and I think we need more of that and then I think th we need more more of what, more, more more initiatives like that that c support filmmakers in the longer run okay. right and then but I think the main thing for me that I've noticed is in addition to representation it's really the decision makers who are picking films for festivals, who are picking people for these initiatives, there needs to be diversity in that space. Because until there is in that space, you're getting people who are making decisions based on their life experience. And if you don't get people that are diverse in that space, you're not gonna get a diversity of people that are being picked for certain roles or certain festivals, festivals and things like that. Okay. Uh, you got about maybe half a minute to answer this question. Anyone who wants to give advice to those who are interested in becoming filmmakers, what advice, what's the best advice you can give them? I would say start small, have a goal, and just achieve it, because once you achieve one goal, you can get to the next step. It's incremental. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're out of time. I want to thank Charles Hain, Acting Director of the Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema at Brooklyn College, and Director, Producer, and Writer Kala Mullick, one of the school's graduates. Thank you for joining me today. For One to One and the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.